Welcome wherever you are in the world to this our fourth webinar in our Back to Basics series. My name is Michelle Pitkin and I am the Vice Chair of the Fire Risk Management Group. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Neil Vincer, the Chair of the Fire Risk Management Group, Gary Laird, who will be leading us today in this lunchtime webinar, and Ian Scott, committee member who will be joining us later as part of the Q&A panel. This series of webinars has been aimed at those who are less experienced in the field of occupational health and safety, but we've also hoped that these have served as a refresher for those who have been in the profession for a little bit longer. In today's Back to Basics session, we are going to look at fire investigation. If you have any questions or need clarification throughout the webinar, please pop them into the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We will answer as many questions as we can live and as part of the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. But if we can't get to them, we will provide a Q&A uh, answer sheet, uh, which will be posted onto the IOSH website after the webinar. And so to our presenter for today's session, Gary Laird. Gary is a member of IOSH and also the Institute of the Fire Safety Managers, uh, ROSPA, the Institute of Leadership and Management, and this is an associate member of the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health. Gary is the former chair of the Fire Risk Management Group and is currently a committee member. As part of Gary's role within IOSH, Gary represents IOSH as a member of the Fire Sector Federation and as a parliamentary liaison officer to the all party parliamentary fire safety and rescue group. In addition, Gary is a member of the parliamentary asbestos in schools working group. Gary has been a key speaker on many occasions, speaking at conferences and meetings worldwide, most notably at the Palace of Westminster to peers and MPs commemorating the 400th anniversary of the Great Fire of London and has attended court on many occasions as a key witness. In his working career, Gary was employed by the West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service for a period of 35 years, engaged in fire safety, fire investigation and strategic management, whilst throughout his career as an operational officer attending a range of large incidents as incident commander. Gary has previously been a member of Calderdale MBC, working as the school senior health and safety advisor for 15 years, and now runs his own consultancy providing health and safety, fire safety and outdoor education along with risk management. Gary is the chair of governors at a large Kirklees primary school, so is aware fully of the detail of school related issues firsthand. Gary holds an honours degree in law and is a trained teacher. When time allows, Gary enjoys walking, reading, caravanning and travel. I'm sure you'll agree that Gary is a very versatile and extremely knowledgeable individual. And it is now my pleasure to hand over to Gary for this lunchtime webinar. Uh, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this webinar on fire investigation. This is one of a series of modern fire safety presentations. And as Michelle has said, I am a volunteer member of the Fire Risk Management Group. It's interesting to note that fire has never been out of the news. And recently, fires that have occurred worldwide have drawn my attention, most notably the one that occurred in New York last week, where 19 people tragically died. It was interesting to see that within 12 hours, they'd actually come to a conclusion as to what the cause of the fire was. Um, that that will, we will maintain, maintain to see that. Uh, what was interesting from my point of view was we had allegedly established the cause of the fire, but we haven't taken into account all the other issues that related to that particular building at the time, namely the fire alarm system, the automatic detection system, the means of escape, etc, etc. The point I will be making during the course of the, of the webinar is that we, as fire investigators, need to be objective because we need to be objective from the point of view that our investigation may well be scrutinised in a court of law and be challenged. So it is really important that we take that on board. 
To start off with, fire investigation, what is the definition? Fire investigation is a logical, structured and demonstrable process comprising often scientific techniques to determine essentially how an unexpected fire started and was able to progress, usually through causing substantial damage to the infrastructure or environment. The key words in any investigation process, when, where, by whom, why and for what purpose will usually fall out of the investigation process. This presentation is intended to give you a look at what principles and practices are available and what to look for in a fire investigation. It may not make you a full-time fire investigator, but it will give you an insight into the process and raise your awareness. As with all investigation processes, depending on who is undertaking the investigation and for what purpose, the agenda may be different. Investigations are often undertaken, one, for law enforcement purposes, by the police and the safety enforcement agency, such as the HSE or OSHA, assisted by the professional fire service, two, by loss assessors who are involved if there is invariably a substantial claim for damages through an insurance claim, and three, for loss prevention by a business owner or investor to determine what technical failures may have occurred and to prevent reoccurrence. Note that there can be a subtle change in emphasis in the term loss prevention. As an employer or business owner, you want to find out the cause to prevent you from losing your business, its stock and your livelihood ever again. Rest assured, if an insurance company tells you that it is wanting to investigate the fire for loss prevention reasons, it is to prevent their losses, not yours. This loss prevention aspect of the investigation will want to establish if the general fire precautions were appropriate for the fire risk. Were there adequate and appropriate means of detection and giving warning in the case of fire? Adequate means of escape? Suitable means of fighting the fire? Specifying the action to be taken in the event of a fire? appropriate and adequate training of staff in the company's fire safety procedure. The consequences. What are the consequences of a fire? Well, the most obvious one, fatalities. And also damage to the buildings, property, infrastructure, heritage, business and people's livelihoods. Loss to yourself, your family, friends, colleagues, co-workers, patients, students, business, neighbours, reputation, livelihood, and sometimes it is consequential damage too. In many instances, consequential damage can be repaired and re businesses can be restarted. However, life cannot be reinstated. The following slides talk through some of the instances of fire and aspects of the investigation. In many instances, consequential damage can be repaired and businesses can be restarted. However, life cannot be reinstated. Image number one shows the Cutty Sark, a ship fire in Greenwich, London in 2007. More about this later, but it shows the consequences of a loss of a national historical asset. Image two is of a pile of biomass fuel for a power station shortly before the fire was discovered under the halogen lighting. Image three is a simple fire in a waste mechanical biological treatment plant in the UK where the fire occurred probably each week. The usual reason is either a physical damage to the LPG cylinders which have been disposed of in domestic waste being crushed in the process machinery. B, discarded through lithium, discarded lithium batteries <coughs> from commercial devices. Or C, carelessly discarded flammable dangerous substances. In slide five, next slide please. 
There's Marriott School in Stevenage. Marriott School and Longsdale Schools are two new schools on one large greenfield site. Marriott is a conventional large comprehensive school with 1,410 students from the age of 11 to 18. Lonsdale is a school for physically and neurologically impaired young people aged from 3 to 18 years. Lonsdale is a residential school with sleeping accommodation, where students live 24-7 in the normal school week, returning home at weekends. Consequently, the fire precautions on site have to be the highest level. On November the 5th, the students set a light to toilet paper in a first floor toilet block, principally to cause disruption to the school. The fire was detected by the automatic fire detection system. The alarm sounded and sprinklers activated, which extinguished the fire. The sprinkler system throughout the school is powered by a standalone diesel engine pump. All students and staff evacuated safely without incident following well-practiced drills. The residential part of the Lonsdale School did not evacuate. A student has been arrested by the police and will be prosecuted for arson. However, as you can imagine, the consequential losses can be significant. Note the extensive water damage with raised flooring for ITC systems and services, electrical fittings were awash below the floor and building fabric and structure damaged by correct activation of the sprinklers. The school was soon reoccupied. The electrics were dried out, repaired or replaced and are all working again. And the school was fully restored, albeit at a cost of over one million pounds. The investigation was simple and straightforward as to how the fire started and how it was dealt with, but addressing why did the young students start the fire was much more complex. And during my fire service career, I have dealt with a number of investigations exactly the same as this. The next slide, the Fry Building, University of Bristol. The Fry Building, University of, Brill of Bristol, on the 5th of January 2018, was taken by a drone, which is a very useful piece of technology. So why do we investigate fires? Simply to establish the origin and the cause of the fire, to determine what went wrong, and to prevent repetition. It's interesting, looking at the photograph, they are very similar to the Glasgow School of Art, which burned twice. The Fry Building is a historic building, tower building on the campus of the University of Bristol in the city centre. Contractors have been brought in to work on the roof of the building to repair water damage and leaks. This is a classical fire investigation where the fire has broken out as a result of an industrial process, namely hot work. The contractors should have recognized the hazard of hot work and operated a permit to work system with a fire watch on the work activity and returning to the work site an hour after work had been completed to ensure the work had cooled down and the fire had been removed, the fire risk had been removed. Unfortunately, the use of blow lamps to melt lead and reset flashings had caused smouldering in the ancient oak beams of the roof. The catastrophic damage and the loss of heritage is obvious here. Next slide, please. Dormer Wells Schooling Ealing. This is another example of hot works that have gone wrong. A water leak in the new school, a new school roof was traced to a penetrating support. This was sealed externally with liquefied bitumen. No hot work permit was used. Heat conducted through metal support structures. The combustible Tyvek membrane was ignited. The following images show the scene. Next slide, please. Consequently, fire broke out and established itself in the roof void insulation material. Before and after shots 
show the components comprise an outer light metal rain screen with an external polymer coating, often white to reflect heat and light, aluminium, zinc, copper, etc. An optional, an optional water resisting membrane, an insulating membrane, and a subframe or structure to support the insulation, fixtures and fittings. Next slide, please. Dormer wells, hot works were taking place on the roof to seal existing roof, roof leaks. The various types and forms of construction. Essentially, an insulating synthetic foam was used with fire resisting properties, with a coating on each side of thin aluminium foil or a thicker aluminium sheet on the surface. Next slide, please. Note drips of burning plastic. Note the drips of burning plastic from the polypropylene weather tight membrane. Significant supporting media installed with large air gaps. Good conductivity with metal supports. Combustible membrane, but not combustible core in the ACM. And note that this, ACE, that this TAVAC membrane was not the fire safe version. Note the single skin outer rain screen. Burning was smelt for an hour beforehand and was thought to be a neighbor burning garden waste. Mo no smoke was seen. No automatic fire detection was fitted in the roof void. Next slide. Flammability of materials. Testing the Tyvek membrane flammability, the notes and note also the low melting point of this material. In this informal fire test, the rate of burning vertically was 10 centimeters in, 10 se in 20 seconds. Note the way in which molten globules of plastic fell like raindrops onto the materials below. There was no automatic fire detection systems and the Tyvek membrane used was not the fire resistant version. The fire resistant version was slightly more expensive. It is present behind the light metal rain screen to give weather protection, which it does. The work was undertaken without a hot works permit. The contractor was working alone and there was no fire watch. Next slide, please. The Cutty Sark, 1869, historic. Another classic fire with industrial origins and people at work and involving nearly irreplaceable heritage. The cause was initially thought to be arson. Hot works and smoking had been ruled out, which seemed a little rash initially. But after the night watchman's log was found to be falsified, and after a torn out page from the log book completed ahead of time was found in a bin, Thoughts turned to a different answer. Next slide, please. Note the, the interior of the hull. The excavation of the seat of fire adjacent to an industrial electrical vacuum cleaner. The machine had been left running for two days since work finished on the Friday. Meanwhile, the watchman slept in his cabin. The cleaner itself was found choked with dust and debris. The motor overheated and the cleaner became the source of the ignition, as shown in the subsequent fire tests. Next slide, please. An interesting factor in this investigation was that the patron of the Greenwich Museum was a certain, the late HRH, the Duke of Edinburgh. When told of the circumstances of the fire, Prince Philip was less than happy with what he'd heard and urged speed in the investigation to get to the root of the fire in what we shall say Prince Philip's usual style. A duplicate industrial vacuum cleaner was used in the tests after being overloaded with dust and debris. The evidence reinforced one aspect of fire precautions that we all know. Ventilation of electrical appliances and apparatus must always be maintained. 
machines must be cleaned regularly. Although assumed to be non-combustible, the dirt and muck caused the electric motor to overheat, giving rise to a source of ignition which ignited the surroundings. The most innocuous of materials and processes have the potential to cause great losses with huge consequences. Next slide, please. Victoria Hospital, Kirkcaldy in Scotland. Human ingenuity. Setting fire to something that should not burn. How do you set a lavatory alight? In fact, it is a hospital ensuite shower room setting. And at the time, the patient was in his bed in an adjacent room. As a result of a construction error, the fall on the floor of the shower drain was not steep enough or the drain was not suitably sized and large enough to allow the water to drain down from the shower area without spilling onto the adjacent floor area. Any idea, an idea was hatched to glue down the rubber edging strips to form a bun wall around the drain area to contain the water. When the solution was applied, the client was less than impressed as these bund walls to prevent spillage formed an ideal trip hazard, especially for elderly and infirm patients. The rubber strips had to be removed. However, the glue was resilient. There were two possible solutions. One, refloor the bathroom, expensive, and this could place unavailability on the bathroom and the hospital bed for a couple of days. Or two, alternatively, bring in a cheap contractor to peel off the strips and remove the glue residue from the floor. The second contractor option was chosen. No risk assessment and method, st method statement was submitted for review before the work started, as this was a matter of urgency. So the lads cracked on with the job. However, cleaning the glue away, reinstating the floor and making good was proving to be harder than they thought. So they then hatched a plan to use a chemical means to assist and sort a solvent to do the job. Next slide, please. Imagine the conversation between the contractors. What actually is Tremco AW4214? It's an industrial cleaner, boss. It's cheap as well. It'll do the job all right. Oh, that's okay then. It did the job all right. Always read the label. So what is AW421? Next slide. Does this give you a clue to what the clueless contractors were working with? What could be in AW421? Look at the GHS symbols on the new packaging can. It is a harmful irritant, a health hazard, and it is flammable. Any of the three Bentleys could have got around the track on a couple of cans of this. And essentially, but not literally, you can buy something very similar to AW421 anywhere. Next slide. Essentially, the bottom line here was that the contractors had chosen a highly flammable liquid comprising toluene and methyl ethyl ketone and a xylene and a double benzene ring aromatic chemical. It is essentially commoner garden petrol. If the contractors had been properly supervised and managed, the incident would not have occurred. If they had carried a can or plastic fuel container of petrol into the hospital to do the job, then hopefully somebody would have stopped them. They closed themselves into the bathroom pod and set to work. They pressed on and reportedly poured half a litre of the liquid onto the floor. Essentially, it had virtually no effect. The glue was already dry, but they scrubbed away with cloths. What happened next? The liquid ignited. In the initial stages of the investigation, the ignition could have been attributable to static electricity from synthetic material clots being rubbed on the floor in the presence of highly flammable vapor, 
An alternative could have been the heat generated from the friction of rubbing the floor vigorously, which could have ignited the fuel. But we need a simpler solution, although the contractors admitted no wrongdoing. In fact, it was found that some time later from idle chatter reported from a public house in the town that when they realized what they had done and could not mop up the unintentional spillage, they decided to flash off the solvent using a cigarette lighter. The fire, which they were very lucky not to be harmed by, set off the automatic fire detection system, which operates on the silent alarm. The first ward, the ward system knew of the incident was when a local authority fire officer arrived at the ward door to tell her he had come to put the fire out. What are the consequences? Significant damage that needed to be repaired, loss of availability and functionality, which in the end cost more money than just relaying the floor. What was the outcome? The contractors were removed from the site. When confronted with the allegations of real causation, the contractors admitted the facts and consequently lost their jobs. Next slide, please. Another example of human ingenuity, setting fire to something that should not burn. The pitch was manufactured from polypropylene fibers and tested in Germany by TUV as non-flammable. Rubber crumb is added to give the ball some bounce, but the local authority doubled up on the crumb so that students did not hurt themselves in falling on the pitch. They did not want injury claims from parents. On this occasion, bored young local youngsters intended to set fire to the gold nets, a light with lighter fuel, but the fire got out of hand. The need to test materials. Next slide, please. The need to test materials, if they are described as non flammable or even non combustible, do not think that they are. Here, the problem was that the rubber crumb, which was the size and shape of instant granules of coffee, provided an opportunity when mixed with the blades of plastic grass to lodge oxygen molecules in situ within the rubber crumb mix. Essentially a perfect mix to provide fuel and oxygen held firmly in place until the ignition came along. This situation was made worse by overloading the grass blades with more rubber crumb than specified. But as usual, things got out of hand. They bought a glass bottle of lighter fuel with the, and set the nets alight. But some of the fuel spilled onto the pitch and after setting fire to the nets and the pitch, the rubber crumb set alight and spread readily and rapidly out of control. Some invaluable evidence came on social media from mobile phone footage shot by local residents. There were no harmful effects to people, although the black dense smoke from burning rubber crumb could have been dangerous. At least the fire was in the open and no, no smoke logging was possible. Next slide, please. During the construction of a major hospital in Wakefield, West Yorkshire, an incident occurred at approximately 1345 hours when the welfare substation supplying power to the contractor's dining room caught fire during inspection prior to the planned shutdown at 1500 hours. The shutdown was planned to enable contractors to install current transformers on the supply cables in the transformer switch gear, switch gear compound to monitor power usage and presumably to send the bill to the right person. The contractors on this occasion were told that work had to be undertaken after service for the day was closed at 1500 hours, so as not to interrupt the service of meals at lunchtime. On this occasion, the incident was reported immediately to site management. Project emergency response plan initiated. The fire service attended and extinguished the fire after receiving confirmation that power to the substation had been isolated. All clear from the fire service was given at 1440. 
Note the firefighters sheltering behind the metal staircase. Essentially, the heat and the smoke could have rendered this means of escape unusable in the event of the fire. But would this have been picked up in the fire risk assessment? Next slide. Electrical substation. Note the proximity of the substation to the building. It is close enough for the fire to scorch the building. Apparently workers inside the porter cabin type building were watching the fire. Temporary buildings of this type offer virtually no protection against fire. Next slide. So how did this happen? The contractors were on the job, were on a job and knock scheme where they were paid a day's work for doing a specific job, regardless of the time taken. This was an incentive to the hourly paid to get the job done quickly, finish the job and knock off. So they went not prepared to delay the work until 1500 hours to get started. They persuaded the site manager give them the keys to the substation compound earlier so they could prepare and see what tools and materials they needed. A likely story. Unfortunately, not all the tools were returned. A 13 millimeter ring spanner is missing as someone dropped it down the back of the buzz bars and shorted out the power. It is a remarkable that no one was killed in this foolhardy act. There was no PTW electrical isolation procedure or even an AP presence. Next slide. Following the human factors accident classification scheme, model of the incident investigation. In this case, the following com comprise the root causes. A routine or even exceptional violation of the procedures, inadequate supervision of the contractors, the organizational climate at the time. There was no PTW for the work activity, which was fit to, which was to fit current transformers to the supply cables to, a monitor, to monitor consumption. The causation of the event, the techniques wanted to get the job done early so they could finish for the day. They colluded together to do this. The keys to the compound were borrowed well ahead of the time to do the job after lunchtime service. Tools were borrowed, including a set of spanners. The 13 millimeter spanner was never returned after the incident. It vaporized when it was dropped onto the live buzz bars. The ensuring fire scorched the side of the temporary offices and the smoke rendered the means of escape staircase unusable. Astonishingly, no injuries, but a cone lunch had to be served on the day. Next slide, please. Investigation principles. What to do and how to do it. This presentation will not make you an expert fire investigator. It takes competence and time. But what we can do is say a few, to set a few pointers out to get you in the right direction and to raise your awareness. Fire investigation from my point of view is much like our archeology. span So here are a few pointers. Use a structured approach technique, such as the AFACS we described earlier, which has been presented extensively in other fire risk management group publications, etc. Next slide. What to do and how to do is the presentation. Next slide, please. What to do, the legal basis. This is given in paragraph 36B of the HS. G65, which supports regulation of the management of health and safety at work regulations 1999. Employers should measure what they are doing to implement their health and safety policy, to assess how effectively they are controlling risks and how they are developing a positive health and safety culture. Monitoring includes A, having a plan and making adequate routine inspections and checks to ensure that preventative and protective measures are in place and effective. Active monitoring reveals how effectively the health and safety management systems are functioning or not. 
adequately investigating the immediate and underlying cause of incidents and accidents to ensure that remedial action is taken and lessons learned and longer term objectives are introduced. Next slide. Based on the modified HFACS and HFIX, an excellent book, The Principles of Fire Investigation by Roger Cook, sorry, by Roy Cook and Roger Ide, published by the Institute of Fire Engineers, 1985. Unintentional fires will have some human factors or elements to them. People are always the hazard. Unintentional fires will take place. Find out some of the safe actions that people have taken and the preconditions that have led to those actions. Environmental conditions, operational conditions, human conditions, all need to be taken into account when undertaking a fire investigation. Next slide, please. Investigation techniques that can be implemented, and we're going to give an example of a few of them today. This is fairly self-explanatory and involves a set of timelines. Many of the advanced techniques that safety professionals use in risk assessment can also be used in fire investigation. Why? One simple analogy is that fire investigation is the inverse process to building up a risk assessment. In other words, it is the deconstruction of the way the hazards are identified and how the consequences of the hazards and their severity form the risks. In fire investigation, the top event, the fire itself, has already occurred. We need to establish how that happened, what effects it had and how the development of the fire impacted on people, plant, equipment and livelihoods in terms of safety, property, production and business continuity, as we described in the, in the initial slide about the fire in New York. In law enforcement, people would be investigating to establish who was involved in the fire and why. In loss prevention fields, the interest would certainly focus on what are the liabilities and how large. In financial insurance terms, they are likely to be. Some of the techniques we use in roughly chronicle order are using a fault tree analysis, we refer to as an FTA, to determine what the top event is. An event tree analysis, an ETA, to determine the consequences are. A bow tie diagrams to link causes to outcomes. A fishbone diagram, which breaks down in more detail causes, hazards of aspects of the fire to the effects that these causes give. And also a timeline of events backed up and supported by witness statements and technical detail and data, including photographs, social media reports. CCTV and security cameras are that's really required. Doorbell cameras can be used as well. In each instance, we use the techniques to the depth of involvement necessary. In other words, we use many of the techniques as we would do, as we need to, to satisfy us on the identification of causation. So this is where we start. Establish a timeline for events for the fire even using some time before the fire is detected. There is an organizational managerial issues to focus on. Use the root cause analysis as a guide to this process. And on the following slides, we will take a quick look at the glimpse of the graphs, graphics behind these techniques to remind you what they are. You can look at these in greater detail a little bit later on. Now, the first one is the fault tree analysis. A fault tree analysis and identifies the top event from a combination of actions and conditions in the form of a logic tree diagram. It is particularly useful for working out the development of a fire. And I have used this on many, many occasions. Next slide, please. Conversely, an event tree analysis is used after the event 
is used after the event to work out the consequences and consequence analysis. For example, it is useful to determine if planned and installed fire precautions or fire prevention issues acted in the way they were expected to. Really important when investigating a fire that you look at the infrastructure of the fire safety network prior to the fire. These two slides show examples of the FTA and the ETA. Next slide, please. The bow tie diagrams are used to determine in a structured way the causes and effects and to study fire prevention measures and the outcome of the effectiveness. Using a bow tie diagram is helpful in invest inverting the fire risk assessment process. Fundamentally, people and buildings are only ever safe if all these factors work and in the right order. First of all, detection. Then notification. Has the alarm been raised? Have we limited the fire spread through compartmentation? What action has been taken? What behaviour has taken place? What training has been in place to support staff? Are there any fire suppression systems that are in place? The evacuation procedure and the place of safety. Were staff advised and were they conversant with the assembly point prior to the fire? Was smoke venting and design in place and did it activate? Next slide. The fishbone diagram again is another useful tool for breaking down the various categories of issues in the fire and determining the causes and the overall or outlying effects of the fire. Again, very, very useful tool to have in your toolbox. Next slide, please. Investigation techniques. The primary purpose of a fire investigation is to establish the origin of the fire, determine the likely cause and thus conclude whether the incident was accidental, naturally occurring or deliberate. It is vital to establish the cause to ensure similar events do not occur in the case of natural or accidental, or to allow a legal investigation to be conducted in the case of a deliberate fire. Next slide. Key stages, interviewing witnesses. This is paramount. You must interview witnesses at the earliest possible point before memories fade or stories get emb embellished. Locating the seat of the fire. Where was the seat of the fire? Locating and excavating the seat of the fire. Evaluating the evidence that is there on hand before it becomes tainted. Review all your findings and determine a root cause analysis. Report the findings. Next slide. Safety to the scene. Safety related hazards, all of the below, took place. Next slide. Seen hazards and risks from the common industrial hazards include structural collapse of the building, falls from height and falling objects, biohazards if fatalities have been involved, floor voids and exposed cavities, heated materials, pool of fuel and potentially corrosive materials, damage the electricity supply systems, fuse boards and cables. Gas mains and supply, loose debris, asbestos. Identifying the seat, invest in, next slide. Identify the seat of the fire. In multiple seats are discovered, that is odd. Explanation forthcoming. Otherwise, it is a deliberate ignition. An inventory of combustible and flammables identified chemically by instrumental techniques if necessary, as well as means of ignition identified. Electrical power supplies, smoking materials, machinery running or operational, process safety issues with flammable liquids or gases, smoke damage and flame damage, jet 
fires impinging on other materials, transmitted heat and direction of heat travel. When working on site, always, always be conscious there way, may well be asbestos on the ground. I have worked on many sites where it later transpired there was asbestos in the building. And the list goes on. Cooking equipment, heating equipment, proximity to heating equipment, open fires, any hot processes, hot work that was being carried out, electrical equipment, loose or frayed cables, overloaded plugs, daisy chained extensions, poorly maintained electrical apparatus, blocked cooling vents. All this can be gained from witness testimony. Inadequate cooling air, inadequate electrical wiring, Unaddressed known issues, warning signs include overheating, poor performance, intermittent faults, lights flickering and dimming, blown fuses or frequently tripped circuit breakers, incompatible electrical equipment, lighting, static electricity, naked lights, fires that get out of hand by accident, children playing with matches, smoking in bedrooms, discarded smoking materials, sunlight and related thermal events. Electrical batteries, disposal and rechargeable of batteries. Battery chargers, remote control equipment, white goods. We could talk on that for a whole session on white goods, tumble dryers, fluffing filters, washing machines, refrigerators, vacuum cleaners. Chemicals, aerosol cans, bonfires and barbecues, solar panels, malicious intent and arson. Next slide. All fires, no matter how significant you feel they are, should be investigated. Preventing another unwanted fire of the same type is paramount. And remember that we do this for A, life safety, property protection, and business continuity. Learn some investigative techniques from colleagues and start by using definitive, defined industrial safety investigation skills. Document everything. Record what you see, feel, smell, and take many, many photographs of the scene. Work and cooperate with the professionals such as firefighters, the police, and loss adjusters where it is necessary. Write up clear and logical factual reports until you feel confident in being able to offer opinions on causation of fire. Bear in mind, fire makes up 45% of all insurance claims. 65% of deaths are all smoke related. In the case of fire as an investigator, a fire within five minutes can reach 900 degrees centigrade. At 200 degrees centigrade, plastic melts. At 600 degrees, PVC windows and doors will melt. 660 degrees, aluminium melts. These are all the issues that you need to take on board. In the case of a fatality, um, that is a different issue and we will deal with that on another session. A date for your diary. Next slide. Don't forget our next presentation is Friday the 11th of February 2022 at 12.30, Designing for Fire Safety. Thank you for your time. I hope it has been useful. It's certainly been useful for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gary. Um, we've got a few minutes to take some um, Q and A's that have come through. Ian's back with us to to join us for this session. So okay. um, thank you to to both of you. So um, we have had uh, a number of questions come in where we can't answer them. We will get back to everybody um, through the Q and A sheet, which will be available on our website. Right. So um, the first question that we've got. Um, is uh, around additional training. So what additional training would you advise attending specific to basic through to intermediate levels of investigations? Am I okay, Ian? 
Yeah. I think it depends who you are and what is the purpose. If you are working for an insurance firm, then there are specific courses available. During the presentation, we have identified a number of publications, both by the Institute of Fire Engineers and by the Fire Risk Management Group, which will signpost you, A, to techniques that need to be used, but also give you some guidance on where you can get additional training from. Ian, did you want to elaborate? Yeah, well, yes, absolutely right. And also the Fire Safety, the Fire Service College. Yes. Uh, have a very, very wide range of courses and do basic courses for investigation and techniques as well. So they're, they're a leading place to go to. That was, that was remiss of me, and I spent half my life down there. <laughs> yes, Michelle. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, so uh, we just had a similar one in uh, around formal courses and qualifications um, for fire investigation that are recognised by the industry. So just from what you were saying there, Ian, um, the, um, the the place to go is uh, the Fire Sector Federation, was that? No, no, the Fire Service College. Fire Service College, my apologies there. In Morton, so, Morton in Marsh. That's lovely. So uh, Dominic, hopefully that's answered your question there. Um, another question that we come in around the investigation process was, would it be useful in some cases to use the inventory analysis to support the fire risk assessment process? I, I would say yes. I would say yes. If you are going out to do a fire investigation, it has to be A, objective and B, structured so that you can put all the evidence together and collate it. And, and what you've just described there is an excellent means of doing that. Ian, would you, would you care yeah. to elaborate on that? Absolutely, absolutely right, because one of the key things in the investigation process is literally to, to do an inventory of combustibles and flammables, and also the means of ignition. And if they are different numerically, as, as a number of incidents or by volume or weight of material or, or whatever, from what you would actually expect, that has to be explained. Yes. Why, yes. why do you have 400 kilos of, of combustible material in the workroom today when normally you're only working at 100 kilos for the whole day? Yeah, yeah quite so right. So doing, doing a, a mass balance, as it were, or, or a volumetric one, working out what are the combustibles and flammables and also how many means of ignition have you got is part of this, what I've used the term before, deconstruction of the, the sort of risk assessment process and, and working out what could go wrong. Lovely. Thank you to both of you there. Um, so again, um, more details uh, around the investigation process. So where a fire has caused significant damage or has destroyed buildings and structures, that makes to um, restrictions uh, in finding evidence for investigations. Are there any techniques or processes um, to find out the root cause of the fire that would be used? I would say in the first instance, work with partners. And when I say partners, I'm talking about the fire service, I'm talking about the, the insurance companies. Um, we need to be careful that we don't disturb the site if we're trying to find the cause and we don't also contaminate it as well so we have to bear in mind that the evidence that we are collecting we need to be able to support in a court of law anywhere in the world um, and that is really important Ian yeah well, one of the techniques and points we, we saw illustrated early on in the presentation with the Fry building and that's simply photography and I think it's much easier these days because digital imagery is much more readily available, but also in terms of building and structure, you have more detail in plans. Um, Gary mentioned earlier, or you mentioned also about the College of Art in, in Glasgow. Yes. So extensively photographed and described and detailed and drawings and such like. So you've got a very good idea about what it looked like before the incident occurred. Yes. And being able to take photographs after the incident you can see, if you pardon me, the flippancy here, you can see where the gaps are. Yes. So why is that? Why has something been consumed in this area that may give you an indication to where a seat of fire was or where there was a, an excessive amount of combustible or flammable material or it, uh, it, it couldn't vent or, or, or it explained uh, by, any, by any other way. So 
being able to take lots of photographs is, is a very useful technique and then compare it with plans, drawings and, and images of historical content of buildings. Just, just one other point. I, I keep raising the point about being objective throughout. You will hear a lot of witness statements and it's important to get in early so that memories don't fade or they don't get embellished. Um, but equally, make your own mind up because you will have to provide that evidence in other arenas. And there is nothing worse, having done it on many occasions, to be challenged by in a court of law as to your evidence. So you need to be satisfied the evidence is clear. Absolutely. Thank you, um, Gary and Ian, for that one. Um, just keeping an eye on the time. Um, we've probably got time for a couple more. Um, so we've had one in um, around the relationship between asbestos and fire and how that can affect you during the investigation process. Could you just touch on that for us, Gary, Ian, please? This is an interesting point because as a former fire safety officer, I can think of occasions when we used to recommend asbestos. That was many, many years ago. Times have changed um, and I am conscious of the, the, the wider implications of asbestos. When you're going into a building whose fabric has been destroyed, um, just be mindful. I can think of a number of occasions where I've gone into a building and suddenly been told that you do realise there was a lot of asbestos in this building. Well, I wish you'd told me that an hour ago because I would have. And it comes a second nature that when you go in, you, you put PPE on, including a face mask. And, and certainly if there is any concerns regarding asbestos, you get some sample testing done at the outset because you don't want to become a victim. Ian? Yeah, it depends on why you're investigating, who you are and for what purpose, etc. If, if it's part of, if it's another um, depot or factory within the, the group of companies you work for, for example, and maybe you haven't been there for ages, it's always, before you before you actually set foot in there, it's always worth having a, a conversation with the local manager. What's yes. actually, what's happening? What are you doing here? What have you been storing? What have yep. you been working yep. on? Because um, unfortunately, fire will destroy labels on packaging yes. um, yep. and such like, and you have to assume the worst case in terms of PPE, Gary's already mentioned about respirators and such like, um, you might think it looks a bit over the top, but I can assure you it isn't. Uh, just exactly the same as with uh, footwear and boots and, and such like. So always assume that something that you're looking at is pretty hazardous unless it can be proved to be uh, innocuous or inert. Um, so to, to go through things like that, it's again reverting to the advice Gary gave earlier about inventories and such like and, and looking at materials um, before you actually get anywhere near a point of danger. Yes. I think from the point of view of inventories, and I've had a vast experience of this under business continuity, rather than writing lists, it's probably easier to go around with a camera and just photograph the rooms so people can re record straight away what was there and the capacity. That is really, really useful evidence to see photographs before the fire. There's some great advice there. Thank you both. Um, I think um, we have actually now run out of time to answer any more questions, but please be assured those of you who have put questions into the Q&A function, we will be responding to all of those. So uh, please uh, do not worry that we won't, um, we won't be able to answer those. Um, I would like to thank Gary for today's uh, webinar to Neil, who has been working in the background answering your questions, and Ian for helping out with the presentation and the Q&A session at the end. I can't forget Dimple, who has been making sure that our technical issues have been resolved um, throughout the presentation. So thank you, Dimple, for helping us there. As Gary mentioned, we have our fifth lunchtime webinar on February the 11th at half past 12, where we will be talking about designing for fire safety. 
So we hope to see you again on the 11th of February. But for now, thank you for attending and have a good evening, good morning, or a good day wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.